Welcome to today's chapel message and program for Boyce College and Southern Seminary. Our preacher for today, Dr. Brian Payne. Dr. Payne serves as Associate Professor of Christian Theology and Expository Preaching. He also serves as the Teaching Minister and Senior Pastor of the First Baptist Church of Fisherville, Kentucky. Prior to his seminary training, Dr. Brian Payne worked in the business world. He served at Big Oak Ranch, a children's home. He taught and coached at Westbrook Christian School. He attended the University of Alabama, where he played football for four years and served as a graduate assistant coach for two years. He's the author of the book, Encountering God Through Expository Preaching, Connecting God's People to God's Presence Through God's Word, a book he co-authored with Jim Oreck and Ryan Fullerton. Brian Payne is married to Heather, and together they have five children, Ella, Nate, Seth, Ava, and Sephan. I'm looking forward to this message, and after the message will come music, a conversation, and also a testimony you won't want to miss. Well, good morning. If you would turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel 9, the ninth chapter of 2 Samuel. As you're turning, I will pray for our time together. Father of mercy, we thank you that we know you as a God of mercy. We thank you that we know you as Father because of what our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, did, accomplished as our substitute, taking on human flesh that he may obey and suffer as a man, as our substitute, fulfilling all righteousness, dying on the cross for our sins, being raised for our justification. And because of the work of the Spirit applying His all-sufficient work to our hearts, we can call you Father. We are adopted joint heirs this morning, and we thank you for that comfort. We pray as we consider 2 Samuel 9, you would give us eyes to behold the glory of those realities anew. And we ask this for your son's sake. Amen. Three and a half years ago, my family and I went down to Louisiana, Slidell, Louisiana, and we picked up our son, Sifan, who was eight years old at the time. And Sifan assimilated in our family immediately. He loved our family. We loved him. In fact, the first night that we picked him up, he looked at me and he said, can I call you dad? And I said, of course you could call me dad. I am your dad. And so for about a month, things were going really well. But about a month in, he, he was caught stealing a snack. My older daughter, oldest daughter, said, I'm going to tell dad that you stole a snack. And Sifan responded by running away. And when I say he ran away, I mean he ran away to another county. He went to a family, a strange family's house, uh, and he knocked on the door and he told this family, I need a new home. Well, they knew better than to leave that alone, so he, they called the police and the police came and got him and found their way back to our house. And when he came in the house, I bent down and got eyeball to eyeball with, with Sifan and I said, Sifan, you, you love being in our home why did you run away? And he looked at me and he said, I thought that when you found out that I stole a snack, that you were going to give me away. And then I looked at him and I said, Sifan, do you know what your problem is? You still think you're an orphan. And you're not. You're a son. And then I had this epiphany. That's my problem as well. When I struggle with inordinate fear or anxiety or discouragement or despair, I'm thinking like an orphan and not like a son that I am. And, and that's why texts like 2 Samuel chapter 9 are so critical for the people of God. For in it, we're not just reading about history, though it's true history. We're reading about covenant history, which means we're learning about the nature of our Lord, who is our Father. We're learning about the nature of His King, our elder brother. We're learning about the nature of the kingdom of God. We're learning about the hesed, the emmet of God, the steadfast faithfulness and love of our God. 
And all of these realities are soul strengthening. They, they enlighten our eyes. And this is so critical because we as former orphans need to understand more and more what it means to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ adopted into the family of God. Now, notably, notably in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, which kind of drives the rest of the Bible, if you, if you will, God promised David, King David, that his house and his kingdom shall be sure forever. And what's interesting about that, this doesn't just impact the people of Israel. It has international implications. In chapter 7, verse 19, he says, this instruction is for mankind. This Torah, this law is for Ha'adam. This is for all of humanity. In other words, the covenant that God makes with David is a par partial fulfillment and the means of fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant where the seed of Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations. And so that covenant promise has implications for us all. Now in chapter 8 of 2 Samuel and chapter 10 of 2 Samuel, which surround our text, we see David conquering territory in every direction. It's kind of an installment on the covenant promise that the Lord had made with him. And maybe it's the Lord's covenant faithfulness that David is pondering and is what stirred him in his memory of another covenant that he had made some 20 years earlier with his friend Jonathan. That brings us to the first part of this passage. 2 Samuel 9 says, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? That's the Hebrew word is hesed. That I may show him hesed for Jonathan's sake. And so 20 years earlier, Jonathan asked David, while David was still on the run from Saul, but was destined to be king, and Jonathan believed the promises. He believed the promises that were made to David. He says in 1 Samuel 20, verse 15, do not cut off your hesed, your steadfast love, from my house forever, when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. You see, Jonathan believed the gospel promises. Verse 16, and Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. And so David is pondering that covenant and he is pondering the promises he had made out of that covenant. Now notice in verse 2, now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the hesed, the kindness of God, to him? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. It appears that Ziba assumes that David would be not interested in someone like that because a crippled man could not benefit this, this kingdom, which was a warrior kingdom. David was a warrior king, and a, a crippled person could not in any way contribute. The king said to him, where is he? I love that. And Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Maker." the son of Emil at Lo Debar. Now we're seeing a picture here of the proactive nature of Hesed in the flesh, Hesed incarnate. Interestingly, it says here that Mephibosheth was in a place called Lo Debar. The, the word lo means no in Hebrew. And, and debar here is from the root meaning um, pasture land. Or you could say no pasture, no pasture land. So it, it's depicting this man as a nobody, 
living in a place of desolation. He's in exile. That's what Lodabar represents. He's exiled, which meant he had lost his inheritance and he had no hope in the world as a result. And and it's important to understand this in order for us to see the glory of verse 5 and what David does in verse 5. Now notice in verse 5, then King David sent and, and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Emil at Lodabar. Now this is an exodus. This is an exodus from exile affected by the king. And so this man is brought out of exile in the place of no pasture land, a place of barrenness and obscurity and desolation, and he's brought into the city of peace. He's delivered from darkness. He's transferred into the, to the kingdom of the Son of God's love. That's what we see here. And I want you to note his response. When someone has experienced that kind of exodus, they're going to respond accordingly. Notice in verse 6. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, For I will show you kindness, I love this, for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Now notice this language of for the sake of your father. With these words, Mephibosheth's world was changed forever. It meant not only sonship for him, but it also meant that David's blessing on Mephibosheth was bound not by Mephibosheth's performance or his worth, but it was bound by David's oath to Jonathan. In fact, you could say here that it changed Mephibosheth, not just circumstantially, it changed him from the inside out. Later in chapter 19, we will see in verses 24 to 30, Mephibosheth's complete fidelity and devotion to David. It changes him from the inside out. And and grounded by David's oath to Jonathan, we're going to see three promises here. Notice, first of all, Mephibosheth's, the promise of protection. He says, do not fear. Do not fear. Now, broken, in a broken and fallen world, do we have reasons to fear? Of course we do. And that's why we have these commands. Do not fear. He says, do not fear, for I will show you hesed. I will show you kindness. In, in Scripture, amazing promises often follow this oft-repeated command, to not fear. And, and the reason we're told, commanded not to fear, and the reason we're given promises in conjunction with that command, is that from the worldly perspective, human perspective, there are legitimate reasons to fear. Legitimate reasons. We see them now even as we turn on the news, don't we? But the promises are always greater reason not to fear. He says, do not fear. I will show you hesed. He also promises not only protection here, he promises Provision. He says, I will restore. Don't you love that language? In a fallen world, I will restore to you all the land of Saul. And and that provision here greatly exceeded the original promise that David had made with Jonathan. The original promise was, I will not cut your family line off. Indeed, that brings us to the third promise. He promises position. He says, you will always eat at my table. Always. We're going to see that line four times. What is that a promise of? Relationship, communion, the same status 
as David's sons and daughters. It's beautiful. In other words, Mephibosheth will be treated as family. He'll be treated as a son. He is a restored prince. And this has connected with Mephibosheth. It has deeply humbled him. Notice in verse 8, And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? He recognizes he doesn't deserve this. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table. Isn't that beautiful? Like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for the fourth time, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Reminds us that it was nothing that Mephibosheth earned it wasn't based on his performance. It was not based on his worth. It was based on a covenant promise David made for Jonathan's sake. Protection, provision, position, in spite of the fact that there are two things going against Mephibosheth that made this so unlikely. First of all, his hereditary. He was the son of the previous enemy regime. He was born into a royal line that was at odds with the true king. That's been the story up to this point. Before Mephibosheth was even born, his family rebelled against the king. His family rebelled against God and his kingdom through Saul, his grandfather. And aren't we like Mephibosheth? We really are. We're born into a royal line as well. Our father was a king who was given the task to take dominion and to rule. And he once ruled. His name is Adam. And long before our birth, our family rebelled against God the true king in Adam. Well, there's a second thing that makes this so improbable. He's lame. He had nothing to offer the kingdom. There was nothing he could do to offer this warrior king anything of note. And likewise, our status in the kingdom of God is not grounded by our fitness. It's not grounded by our worth. It's grounded by the king's hesed. I love this line from Martin Luther. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. Indeed, just as David succeeded Saul and was enthroned as king by defeating all of his and God's enemies, now, King Adam has a successor king as well. The last Adam who ascended to his throne by defeating all the principalities and powers opposed to God. He disarmed them. He triumphed over them through penal substitution. He took away the guilt that is on all of us as believers and which is the ground of the enemy's dominion. He took it away by being punished in our place and he was raised for our justification. And one day, a messenger arrived to each one of us as believers, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit said to us, 
by the gospel, the king is calling you. He's calling you into his family. He's calling you to all the rights and the privileges of sonship. Last week, I, I met a man. I sat down with a man who, who's just come into a huge inheritance. His father died, and he's, he's inherited this massive uh, amount of money. And, and he looked at me, and he said, I did nothing. I'm simply a son. And because of the finished work of our elder brother, that's who we are. The J.I. Packer says in his wonderful book, Knowing God, that the gospel could be spelled down to three words, adoption through propitiation. I love that. Because of Jesus, our elder brother's finished work, we are all, as believers, sons and daughters of the Father, the Heavenly Father, with all the protection, provision, and position that comes with adoption. Gloriously, in the Gospel of John, do you know what the first evangelical blessing is? It's adoption. It says in John 1.12, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And the climax of the first resurrection appearance, Jesus says to Martha that he was ascending to my father and your father. John 20, verse 7. Through our union now with Jesus Christ, our elder brother and king, we now enjoy God's family. It's a family of lame former exiles. Indeed, 400 years after David, Jeremiah foresaw a day. And he spoke about this day in Jeremiah 31, 8. He says, where God would gather from the farthest parts of the earth. And among them, he would gather in the, the blind and the lame. And that day has been inaugurated. It's been inaugurated in the greater David. And here's what I want you to remember as we close here. There's no cultural crisis. There's no circumstance that you can face that can compromise that. He sits enthroned and nothing can put him off his throne. Nothing can put him back in the grave. And that's why Peter can say, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for his adopted sons and daughters. And he's given us the spirit as a down payment for that inheritance. Which means when anxiety and controlling fear is controlling us, our hearts, it's a sign that we're thinking like orphans and not like sons and daughters. So let us contemplate this text. We have been adopted into the family because of one much greater than David. And his enthronement is the ground of our hope. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace communicated in your son, Jesus Christ, our elder brother. We pray that these truths would comfort your people. And we ask this in the name, the matchless name of our King, King Jesus. Amen. I'm really glad to have joining me today, Professor Michael Haken, who uh, I wish could be right here with me, but because of the pandemic is actually in Toronto, in Canada. And uh, so even as we miss getting to see each other on the campus, Professor Haken is teaching his classes. We're proceeding with, uh, with life and work. And uh, I wanted to have this conversation with Michael Haken about a very seminal figure whose name is actually on a center at Southern Seminary, and that's Andrew Fuller. But first, Michael, welcome. Great to be with you. Yeah, so uh, you teach church history and, uh, and, and Christian devotion and spirituality, and you, your interests range from the early church to the Puritans and beyond. 
but you're also the director of the Andrew Fuller Center. So what is that and why is it named for Andrew Fuller and why does that matter? Uh, Andrew Fuller is, uh, the Andrew Fuller Center uh, has a number of uh, functions on campus. It uh, facilitates a, a conference on an annual basis in church history, um, which uh, especially in our day where history has become a flashpoint, how do we understand the past? How do we deal with it? Um, is uh, a, a very, very important event that uh, is uh, held on an annual basis. Uh, we publish occasional publications that uh, deal with uh, uh, small things that deal with uh, church history. Uh, that gives uh, an opportunity, particularly for doctoral students, uh, to get their first, their, to get their feet wet, so to speak, doing some publishing. And uh, we're also sponsoring the uh, uh, publication of the critical edition of the um, and works of Andrew Fuller. And this is being published with a publishing house, an academic publishing house called De Gruyter, based in Berlin, but with a major office in Boston. And Fuller is significant because he is the theological mainspring behind William Carey. And so in a real sense, he's the theological mainspring behind the modern missionary movement. Right. And so the whole idea of Baptists being committed to the Great Commission, I mean, Fuller is right there. He, he is at the, the fountainhead of that, the globalization of, of the gospel, in the last 200 years. You know, 200 years ago when Fuller was living, evangelical Christianity was limited to Western Europe, the Atlantic seaboard. Now, I mean, it, Asia, Africa, it, the numbers there, as we all know, far yeah. outnumber the numbers in Western Europe, definitely, and uh, are, you know, to some degree, North America as well. And Fuller, it, Fuller really is at the heart of that. Yeah, so let me uh, just kind of trace a little bit of church history with you, because I think most Christians, even maybe uh, students at Southern and at, uh, at Boyce, don't kind of think through the historical imagination about mission. So if you look at the New Testament, uh, Christianity is a missionary movement from the beginning. Uh, you have the Great Commission as an extension of God's saving purpose, and but now with this new covenant people, and Christ sends his followers into the nations to make disciples, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. And uh, and that the Apostle Paul becomes the greatest example of that, right, in the New Testament yep. with his four major missionary journeys. Um, and, and then you also have um, a period of time in which the church is persecuted, and uh, then the recognition of, of the church, the Constantinian peace, but then the church becomes kind of coexistent with the extent of the Roman Empire. And, uh, and this is where I think Christians kind of get off the rails just a bit. So they're wondering why the Christian church did not take the gospel to the ends of the earth, but in their imagination, they were at the ends of the earth. Yep. I, yep. I think it's good to kind of play that out. In other words, it wasn't that Christianity wasn't missionary. Uh, it's this that uh, the means of conveyance, the road, the imagination, the territory of Rome became the world uh, yep. so far as, uh, as Christians then were concerned. So, so when did that change? Well, that begins the change with the, in the th 13, 1400s with the Portuguese uh, mariners beginning to explore the North Atlantic, initially for things like cod fishing, and then beginning to obviously make exploration. Um, Christopher North Columbus has been Africa. in the news, sorry? North and West Africa, the Portuguese also. Yeah, exactly. And um, during the Middle Ages, Christianity is also bottled up in Europe by Islam. Yeah. Islam has kind of ringed uh, Christianity. And it's not until the, this, this kind of age of exploration, European exploration, that uh, uh, Europeans are able to break out of that. Right. Well, I, I think it's a huge question that all Christians want to know. And that is, you know, why do we talk about a missionary movement beginning uh, in a huge way in the 19th century. You know, what, what, where are the 19th centuries before? And I, I yeah. think it's just good to, to remind ourselves that we assume even a knowledge of the globe that, uh, that those earlier Christians didn't have. And, and even when the age of yes. exploration amongst Europeans began, they had very little knowledge of whether there were even people beyond. But the, in that exploring spirit, they, uh, they went out. You know, Michael, something else that I think uh, we need to remind people of is that uh, if you take the magisterial reformers in the Great Reformation of the 16th century, 
uh, Luther had some concern for uh, reaching to the East uh, and in particular was uh, quite aware of the threat of Islam and, uh, and, and had some concern to the East. But I wouldn't say that was a missionary movement. But the Genevan Reformation under Calvin actually sent missionaries. And uh, I stood yes. uh, just a, a little over a year ago in Brazil, yeah. where some of the missionaries sent out by uh, the, the church in Geneva were martyred. Uh, yeah. and, and so there was a missionary movement, and it followed the, uh, the trade routes that had opened up. Yeah. Yeah, Calvin, when uh, Calvin is, uh, gets the opportunity to send missionaries to Brazil, he jumps at it. And uh, as you said, uh, there is a little spot just near Rio de Janeiro where they landed. And um, um, if Calvin had had those opportunities more, because right. they were landlocked, they didn't have a fleet. Uh, it's quite obvious that they would have taken advantage of them. Yeah, I think it's easy just to say Geneva and you recognize they didn't have a fleet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the modern missionary movement is really made possible by the... Uh, the knowledge of the world, the transportation and trade routes that developed. And of course, uh, the, the, you had the entire, the age of empire and you had ships upon which missionaries could travel to places yep. where uh, they, they could be taken. And uh, by the, the first half of the 19th century, uh, you have people establishing missionary societies, especially in London. And it's, it's London Protestants, evangelicals who are uh, sponsoring these societies, but they were controversial. Now, now that's a bigger question to me. How could missions be controversial among Christians in the 19th century? Well, I, especially among Baptists, um, Baptists had, uh, in certain quarters, had become dominated by a hyper-Calvinism that basically did not offer the gospel freely, even within local communities. And so if, if they're not doing mission at home, they're not going to be doing it at abroad. Right. And then there was a, a, a species of teaching that had emerged among Lutherans that the gospel had already gone to the ends of the earth and the nations had rejected it and we had no responsibility to take the gospel uh, again. And so these twin things really kind of stymied um, gospel advance. And a man I think is very important for the preservation of, of Trinitarian orthodoxy among the Baptists in England, John Gill, he had a very elaborate eschatology in which he had argued that it was not until the slaying of the two witnesses, which wouldn't take place until 1880, that we could do mission. Yeah. So when Kerry comes along in the 1780s and starts to propose this, well, a lot of those men had read Gill. And they said, no, there's no way this is uh, possible because we're not at the historical moment. We have to wait another hundred years and then the time will be right uh, huh. to engage in mission. But Andrew Fuller comes along, the gospel worthy of all acceptation, and, uh, and really not only changes the argument, but wins the argument. Yeah, Fuller is, um, he's a remarkable man in many, many ways. Um, the more I've, he's deeply influenced by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards has a worldwide concern for the advance of the gospel. Um, Fuller uh, em, 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 embraces that or imbibes that. And uh, he has the sort of character, um, he's, he's, he's tough. He can take criticism. Uh, there are certain types of criticism he doesn't like. For instance, there was a woman uh, in a nearby church who wanted to transfer a membership, and her pastor refused to give it to her. Mm. She refused to give her a letter of dismission. And it took 12 years. Until, uh, she had to wait for this letter until the guy finally died. And for, that infuriated Fuller. But Fuller was the, he, he was the sort, he was a Luther character. Mm -hmm. He was able to deal with public criticism, books written against him, uh, but also a, a man of deep, deep love. And what's and the thrust friendships. of his argument, Michael? What's the thrust of his argument? The thrust of his argument is that uh, just as um, we are to freely offer the gospel indiscriminately to our hearers, if that is to be true at home, we must take the gospel abroad. And that Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, the Great Commission, um, which Baptists use as a key text for believers' baptism, <laughs> Jesus says, we're to take to the nations, and he is with us to the end of the age. Surely those, that latter command is right. just as important as baptizing believers. Amen to that.
Well, you have the rise of the modern missionary movement and, uh, and all that follows from that. William Carey going to India. Uh, and then, you know, we have on, uh, on our campus, uh, the uh, Legacy Center, the two wings of which historically, going back to the 1920s, are named for Luther Rice and Adoniram Judson. And uh, they were greatly influenced by Andrew Fuller. Yes, yeah, both of them had read Fuller. Um, and in fact, uh, Judson and uh, Rice are baptized by William Ward in the mission in Serampore, um, or in Calcutta, sorry, um, that uh, William Carey had set up. Yeah, and yeah. William Carey famously uh, translated the Bible uh, into the local dialect. Um, yeah, and actually yeah. Some, some 30 or 30, 30 to 35 languages. Yeah. Uh, but, but his first effort ended with the destruction of his work, and he had to do it all over again. Yeah, there was a fire in 1812 in which the, um, a number of the New Testaments he'd been working on uh, were completely burned. Yeah. I was talking to a, uh, uh, an evangelical leader from India about five years ago, and we were talking about the fact that Carey labored for about seven years before he had his first really clear convert. And, uh, you know, I was thinking how many mission boards will leave anyone on the field these days with uh, you know, seven yeah. years of reports with no conversion. But uh, Kerry stayed there. His heart was for India. He stayed there. And, uh, you know, th this, this was a gospel-minded evangelical leader talking to me, not someone who's just claiming everyone is Christian who says they think well of Christ. And he said, you know, the, the reality is that... Uh, Conservatively, there there have been at least one to two hundred million conversions uh, in the course of Indian history since that time that can be traced pretty much to that missionary effort that, that yes, began. Yes, yes. You think about that, and you think about the miracle of what God does with the gospel. Yes. And uh, other missionaries came, and and other missions were established, churches were planted, but uh, all of them basically came out of that pioneering effort of uh, William Carey and. His, his mind was convinced uh, by Andrew Fuller. Now, yeah. let, me, let me ask you, what, what are the books right behind your head? Uh, well, actually, some of these are, uh, this is Andrew Fuller's works. It's an eight-volume oh, edition. Yeah. And yeah. then up here, we have, um, these, are, uh, most, these are all original editions of Andrew Fuller's works. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Well, uh, I'm very glad to have an eight volume edition from uh, St. Paul's Churchyard of, uh, I just brought one of the volumes. Yeah, well, actually that was the first time I had ever seen that was in your library. And I realized, I, I thought I've got to get one. <laughs> and you did. I did, yeah. I got it through um, a bookseller in Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So uh, at least through Kentucky and me in Kentucky, and now you're in Toronto, there are at least two of those complete sets of... Uh, they're, they're actually quite rare. Yeah, and uh, but that just is a testimony. It's not just old books. We both love old books, but it's not just yeah. old books. It's that these are books that changed the course of Christianity, especially Amen. in the English-speaking world, Amen. and for the cause of the gospel. Amen. And uh, they represent so much the heart and mind and soul of Southern Seminary from the very beginning that was established as a school. With, we had the very first chair of, uh, of missions uh, in any American seminary. And that, that commitment is very long standing. And, wow. when, uh, would that have, when would that have been? The, uh, the late, very late 19th century. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there, there had been a chair established in Berlin. And uh, that was uh, um, a part of the excitement about starting a chair of, of missions. Missiology was not a no. subject area of teaching until then. No. And, no. And, and by the way, amongst the Germans, not always for good. No. Uh, you know, they, they turned it into something else. But among evangelicals, it becomes a, a real focus study to say, how yeah. is it that we are to take the gospel? What can we learn uh, by missionary endeavors? And uh, how can we pass that on? So, Michael, I can't wait to get you back here to the campus. You and are doing well there in Toronto. We are. Thank you. We're thrilled about our son's progress in, in law. And uh, yeah, we're doing well. Thank you. Well, we will look forward to having you back on the campus. Me too. But until then, we're just as proud to have you a member of this faculty, even as you are there uh, in our neighbor to the north. Thank you.
Thank you very much. God bless you. Thanks again for joining me today. God bless. Thank you. You know, Dr. Henry, many people know you as uh, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Orlando for so many years, a ministry that uh, has reached all around the world. You served as president of the Southern Baptist Convention, but, uh, and you're a trustee, a member of the board here at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I've had the privilege of knowing you for decades now, but I just want to ask you to tell the Southern Seminary family, how did you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior? Well, I was raised with a kind of like Timothy and Paul, uh, Eunice and Lois. My father was nominal Christian, but I had a wonderful Christian mother, a wonderful Christian grandmother, and a wonderful Christian great grandmother. So I had that background taking me to church and those kind of good things in Middle Tennessee. Went to First Baptist Church of Nashville in my younger days, and then after World War II. We, my dad went to Pennsylvania to work building airplanes, sent us back to the Nashville area. And I lived in the country with my grandparents for a while, stayed with them. And I went to the old Sawdust Trail Revivals. I, you, some of the younger guys may not know that, but the tent, sawdust, fans from the funeral home, yep. folding chairs, that kind of thing. And that's where I first got under conviction. I heard hellfire preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days. There was a guy named Wade House who was an evangelist. Mm -hmm. So I began to think about my soul and about my spiritual condition. And then I had a book that had Bible stories in it. And one that just stuck out at me was Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I can still see that picture in that book. One day I walked into the uh, parlor at my grandmother's house and my mother was playing on the piano. The only time I ever heard her playing on the piano. Mm -hmm. And she was playing the old rugged cross wow. on the piano. Between that and my conviction about being lost, and I, I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to go to heaven. And Jesus loved me and died for me. So I really began to ponder giving my heart to Jesus. And one Sunday morning, in a little country church, Hopewell Baptist Church. The invitation was given. I went forward, made my confession of faith in Christ. I was scared to death. I felt like my heart was going to jump out of my shirt. I felt like everybody yeah, around how me. How old were you, Dr. Henry? I was about eight years old hmm. when that happened. I remember going back home. My grandmother didn't go to church that Sunday and running in and telling her that I'd been saved. And she was so excited. My mother wanted me to be baptized at First Baptist Church in Nashville because that's where we had gone before the war started and Dad got shipped up to uh, Allentown. So uh, Dr. W.F. Powell was a pastor there, wonderful man. And uh, Dr. Powell kind of became a model for me as a pastor. In fact, some things he did then, even when I was a kid, I didn't realize it. I, I practiced later in my ministry. I learned from him even as a boy. But something that was really special uh, to me and Dr. Powell and the whole situation was my mother, when she was pregnant with me, she didn't tell me this till later mm. after I, I made my commitment to go into ministry. She said she went to Bible class and there was a lady teaching the Bible, Mrs. King. And one day they had prayers and she was pregnant with me. And she said at that prayer time, she said, Jimmy, I, I made a commitment. If, if I had a male child, that I was giving him back to Jesus. And she told me this later. She never told me that until later in my life when I went into ministry. And so I know that my mother had prayed for me to come to Christ and be used of the Lord when I was in her womb. And so I know that that was a part of what the Holy Spirit used to bring me to faith and conviction into Christ. Really sweet. It was a powerful thing to me, and I never have forgotten it. And her wisdom not telling me she didn't want me to do something just because she waited till I'd made that commitment. And then she told me that story. So that's been very special to me. So after that, when I go to the hospital and pray with mothers who've had their babies or getting ready to have babies, I prayed for those babies like my mother did for me. I did that for years. Uh, when I go to talk to a pregnant mother, I tell my story and say, let me pray for your baby, like my mother did for me. 
So that's how I came to faith in Christ. And that's the game of pilgrims and baptized the first Baptist church in Nashville. Later on uh, in my life, I, I, I said, I need to be sure, examine myself that I'm in the faith that the Bible tells me to. And so I had a really a good time with God talking to him. And one day in a very special way in my study, he touched me very powerfully and deeply with assurance and love. And it was a, something I'll never forget. And it even, I think it propelled me more in loving Jesus and following him after that day in the study. So that's just a capsule report. of. That's very, that's very sweet. And uh, again, uh, the love of God is invincible, uh, but the love of a mother and a grandmother is about as close to invincible as we can find on the planet. You're, you're exactly right. You're yeah. exactly right. Uh, Dr. Henry, uh, the Lord allowed me to get to know you, and I was about 19 or 20 years old. I'm so thankful for that. that so that's more than 40 years ago. And <laughs> I saw the ministry uh, the Lord did through you. I knew you'd been at Two Rivers Baptist Church in, in Nashville. And, uh, and, and then at uh, the First Baptist Church of Orlando, and I was born just, you know, 30 miles away, and uh, my boyhood pastor uh, was uh, the, uh, uh, the best friend of the longtime pastor there at the First Baptist Church, Dr. Parker. Okay. And so... Who was your boyhood pastor? Who was it? T. Rupert Coleman. Okay. And uh, he and Dr. Parker were good friends. They, they, were, they had been friends for years, and... and, and, and before either one of them was in Florida, I, I believe, but I knew of the First Baptist Church of Orlando, but Orlando became kind of the center of the universe at, at, at a very real point with uh, the growth of, uh, of Florida, and uh, you led that church in this massive expansion of its ministry, and I can still remember you, you were so kind to walk me around the, uh, the new uh, sanctuary there at First Baptist shortly after it was built, and uh, I have had the honor one way or another of being there so many times and uh and your uh, your own ministry has touched members of my family and our closest circle of friends and and so i i feel like i i uh i know you in a in a different way than most could ever get to know you and then a friendship and uh, you were elected president of the southern baptist convention about a year after i became president of southern seminary you're right and uh, we had the opportunity of working together and uh and, and knowing not only you, but uh, your wife, Jeanette, and uh, the love you had for each other. And uh, the, uh, the remarkable thing is, is that fast forward, you did not know what's going to happen in your life. And honestly, I didn't know what was going to happen in my life. I had the opportunity to uh, talk to my mother in a memory care facility. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary and I were able to uh, FaceTime with her through staff. Oh. And... Uh, you know, it's uh, it, uh, it, it's something I never expected to experience, you know, talking to my mother when I, I'm not at all sure she knows me. Yeah, I know. My own mother, who's, yeah. like I say, humanly speaking, that's an invincible love. I know she loves me, uh, but, uh, and, and uh, she does still recognize, I, there's a, but it's, it's a different world. She doesn't, yeah. she didn't come up with my name. She don't know your name now. She she does not use it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. but you know, she and, and and she's not sure that. I mean, people who died forty years ago. If I mention them, she assumes they're still alive. Right. But but she doesn't make the connection, and it's about an eight second memory loop. Yep. But you lived it through that modeling so faithfully as as Jeanette was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's disease and. Uh, and you and Deb Terry have written a new book. The title of it is What Now? And uh, Dr. Henry, you modeled uh, a husband's love for his wife there in the fog of Alzheimer's until her death. Uh, tell us about, about that. Just, just you know, wh wh what was your assurance through all of that? The assurance was that I knew God was going to see us through because it was something I, I had not expected. And uh, it was scary because I, I realized I was going to walk down a road that I didn't know anything about. I had some people I had had dementia, or Alzheimer's that I'd seen at the church, but not in my family. Right. And so when we realized that Jeanette had this, I, I got on my face before the Lord and said, Lord, you're going to have to help me through this. I can't do this. 
show me how to keep loving her and take care of her. And I'll do the best I can to do that. But so I was the, I was like, what, I didn't know what to do. You know, I had, I read some things about Alzheimer's, but the basic practical things, I didn't know what to expect. And so I started journaling and every day for seven, over seven years, I made a little note at the bottom of my, I, I journal anyway, just a segment for Jeanette. And I'd write what happened that day, how she responded, how she didn't respond, what medicine was she taking? Did she know me that day? Did she know her kids? That kind of a thing. What medicine was she taking? That, so I kept that. And uh, so I'd ask the Lord if I could keep her at home, if I could. And he allowed me to keep her at home. She died at home. It was getting to place so we were about had to put her somewhere because she was getting heavier and physically I couldn't handle her. But the Lord was gracious and she, I, I got to be with her to her last breath at home. And uh, it was, uh, so if you were to ask me the hardest thing in my life, that was the hardest. I've had some tough church situations and other things, but that was the hardest experience of my life but if somebody said if you knew this was going to happen would you marry her again and i'd say a thousand times i'd oh, do it again. sweet well i had the privilege of knowing the two of you together and uh you uh, gave us such a model of a husband's love for his wife um again an earthly model of just a hint of what it means that christ loves his bride the church yeah and uh, I, I, I have to tell you that I, I wasn't eager to read your new book that you wrote with Deb Terry because uh, it hits real close to home. Yeah. Uh, but that was the reason why I needed to read it. And it was just extremely helpful. I want you to know that. I think you've been a real gift to Christians. And uh, given the statistics, an awful lot of Christians, every church, yeah. uh, just, just about everyone we know is going to have to deal with this with someone they love. And You're right. So, I, I, I deeply appreciate the book. Well, every 19 minutes, somebody's diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. Every 19 minutes. Uh, you something that, uh, Dr. Moeller, that uh, I think was very precious. Uh, every night, and here's what I tell younger pastors and teachers, uh, there's some things that Jeanette did not forget. She did not forget the Bible. She wanted to read the Bible, have me read it to her every night even to the last day before she had her heart failure. So she, I could say, God so loved, and she'd say the world. Uh, I, she would fill in the blanks, right. 23rd Psalm. So she had learned the word of God early on in her life, and that's what's still there. She also, the hymns yeah. at church, without any book or anything, she would sing word for word the hymns. And the third thing was a moral thing. Uh, one day we were going up to North Carolina and she said, you can't spend the night with me. And I said, why not? She says, we're not married. I said, well, we've been married for a long time. She says, uh-uh. She said, we're not married yet. I said, well, look at my wedding band. She said, well, you can buy one of those anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, well, huh, why? we're married. She said, Jim, I love you. And I know you love me. We're going to get married someday. But, you know, everything we've ever stood for, what our parents would think, what Jesus would think. She said, you can stay at the house, but after a while, you're going to have to go home. You can't stay with me till we get married. Thankfully, when we got to our destination, she'd forgotten that she told me, because I was saying, where am I going to sleep tonight? But here was something that had stuck in her mind since she was a child. And so those things that you put in your children's minds and heart when they're young, even Alzheimer's did not rob her of that. That is really sweet. Thank you for taking the time to share that. And uh, the same thing's true with my mom right now. Uh, the scripture and hymns, they're, they're there. Yep. And uh, that's, uh, that's an incredible testimony to the power of God's word. Uh, right. Just in, in more recent times, you've gotten married again. Yes, I did. I sure did. Uh, dear friend of both me and Jeanette, her husband and Kathy were in our church for 35 years, and she and Jeanette were big friends. And she she helped me with Jeanette for a long time. She and Jeanette would go out for coffee, and she was just a good. So we known each other a long time. So that's very sweet. God, God gave her to me, and so 
I'm married again and starting to learn how to be a husband again. <laughs> I, uh, I have a feeling you've got, uh, you, you, you've got, a lot more experience than just about any husband uh, brings to this. But uh, Mary and I just uh, wish for you and Kathy many years of happiness and joy. And we look forward to getting to meet the two of you together in person post COVID. Uh, yeah. We can, uh, when we can be together again. But uh, Dr. Henry, you've been an encouragement to so many. I know so many pastors who would say that, that, that their ministries were directly impacted and encouraged by you and your ministry. And, uh, You've uh, you've always encouraged me as well, and I want you to know how much I appreciate that, and I appreciate your service on this board of trustees, and I get to say in front of the whole Southern Seminary family, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Moeller, for the privilege, and you've been an encouragement to me. I've often said if I was in a debate uh, with an atheist or agnostics or somebody like that at a public forum, uh, give me Al Moeller and Adrian Rogers and turn us loose, and I think we win every debate. I respect and admire you so much, and you and Mary, and for the hospitality you extend to us, too, as trustees and others. And I also want to say that I pray for you all. Thank you. And for Southern Seminary, for the boys' school. It's a privilege to be a trustee at Southern, and thank you for your leadership. Well, God bless you. One of the God's greatest gifts to all of us are the people with whom we get to work in Christian service and ministry. So yeah. God bless you, and thank you for joining me and sharing your testimony today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in person just as soon as we can. Okay. And one other thing, Dr. Bowler, anything good that comes out of my life mm. is to God's glory alone. Amen. Because it's not him here. It's, it's him. And I'm a grateful camper. Good reminder for all of us. Uh, God bless you, sir. Rejoice in his great love.